good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're calling from. I'm Ellen Ermer, and I'm one of the organizers for the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division webinars that happen monthly, as well as Manny Veloso. So today we're going to have David Ball, um, who's presenting Process Focused Quality Culture. And I'd just like to get a couple logistics out of the way, remind you that we do have these webinars monthly. Uh, the second Wednesday of every month. The next webinar will be August 11th. And also reminding you that you will get a certificate of attendance and this will come to you automatically about 24 hours after the webinar completion. Uh, in addition, you'll probably see um, on your screen or on your monitor to the right hand side is a small window where you can ask questions or you can send things uh, by chat. You can send privately or send to all, um, but this is a way that you can pose questions to the speaker and then at the end of the presentation, I'll be uh, offering up those questions to the speaker to address. And also, if you have questions in particular for me or some logistics questions, you can put that in there too. Typically, people also ask, and we have the PowerPoint or the presentation, uh, that is up to the presenter and um, we could talk about that at the end or how he might want you to obtain that if he does. So this is just, there are no handouts in here today, so um, that's not something we'll have to pay attention to. And that's really it. So please enjoy this webinar. I'm gonna have David uh, introduce himself and thank you so much for your attention. Let's see, so David, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Mm -hmm. And let me know if, uh, let's see, show my screen. And you guys tell me, or you tell me, Ellen, if you're seeing my screen. I am. Let me put but this in presentation in, mode. Yeah. And there you go. Perfect. You. Okay. We are in good shape. Thank you. All right. And just time check. We've got an hour for this. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, and if you leave about 10 minutes at the end, you know, five to 10 minutes for questions, that'd be appreciated. All right, if I get going and uh, we get too close to the end, if you just give me a 10 minute uh, warning, that'd be great. I will. All right, thank you, Alan. All right, guys, um, uh, welcome to this session where I'm gonna be talking about something that um, you may or may not have uh, considered in your, your lean deployment, uh, you, you may have considered it. But if not, it'll be something new to you um, in the next uh, hour or so. We're going to talk about a process-focused quality culture. Now, it's a, it's a mouthful, I know, but um, I want to explain to you through my experiences in, in implementing Lean and Six Sigma throughout organizations and also quality, that quality mindset. Um, it's something that, um, you know, it's come to my mind that, that focused Folks just don't know what that means. So we're going to um, dig into this today. So a little bit about myself. Uh, so you know me. I'm, uh, I've been in uh, industry for, for around 31 years. Um, uh, 16 years of it is in automotive. Um, you know, I did a, the quality manager in engineering. Um, and then went into the Lean Sigma uh, black belt aspect of it. Um, some accomplishments we did, um, you know, the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award was part of that process, which is quite extensive if you guys have went through that. Um, in the state of Virginia, where I was mostly held, was uh, they've got their own, uh, it's called an SPQA. We, we won that many years in a row, uh, different levels of it. But, uh, you know, the organization, as far as recognition of quality, was immense and it was uh, required for us. Uh, we also won some Industry Week magazines, uh, top 10 plants. So highly well recognized the, the type of operations that I was part of. Uh, we were trained by Toyota because we did supply them. At one time, we were the one of the few um, you know, manufacturing facilities in North America that was supplying straight to Toyota, uh, which you guys who have worked in the automotive industry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, for some reason, Folks are telling me they have no sound. Let me see what's going on here. Are you hearing me though? I am hearing you. Okay, so it must be on their side. 
uh, cannot hear. Oh, some can. Oh, they can hear. Okay. I can. Okay, sound is fine. All right, never mind. Go ahead. Thank you. I guess it was just a couple of people, maybe. All right. Thank you. Uh, you know, we, we supplied tiers one, two, and three, um, you know, and then I transitioned from automotive into pharmaceutical about 15 years ago. And people say, how you, how did you do that? Well, a lot of the processes we do in quality and the continuous improvements aspects are plug and play. It doesn't matter what we do. So I learned the industry quite immensely and I've worked in multiple different, uh, um, you know, divisions of it from the clinical operations and R&D all the way through the commercial operations and sales and marketing through the manufacturing and the distribution, what I call the full life cycle. So it's uh, it's been quite a learning environment for me, which I really like. Uh, I spent time in consumer healthcare, even uh, dealing with uh, over the counter stuff, which was which is fun. Um, you know, my training, um, I lean Sigma master black belt. Uh, I've got many ASQ certifications you can see there as well uh, plus I'm um, a, a GCP which is um, a good clinical practices expert. Uh, in my current role right now I'm a global head of quality management and um, you know we, we it's a uh, really good role for me and um, enjoy doing what I do so that's a little bit about me. Um, so as we go into this, you know, I, I put this slide on here it's kind of fun it's called the first first things first right so the the elements of, of what does it mean to be lean and um, the context of what we're talking about, um, you know, there's, there's the organizations that are implementing all the elements of lean. And I know I've put it in here, a lot of different bubbles around what, what pure lean is. This is usually how people identify lean. Uh, there's more to it than this. Uh, it's the behaviors behind lean plus the, the actions and the, um, the elements that you see here that make up pure lean. Uh, and, and most of the organizations that are uh, implementing what I call the pure lean approach, they'll look at you and say, well, this, um, uh, this you know, process focused quality culture is a no brainer. You got to have that. Uh, so yeah, I, I do understand that. But for the rest of the world, which I, I did look at the, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and seeing, you know, manufacturing only makes up about 8.5% of all the jobs. So most of the organizations that are implementing pure lean are manufacturing. Uh, but that means, you know, um, 80, what, 3% uh, of the rest of the world may not be implementing pure lean, plus most of the manufacturings are not as well. So that leaves a delta. And what it means is, um, you know, basically pure lean's not being pursued by most companies. Um, but the, most companies or industries are implementing some elements of lean, and most of those are been are focused on cost reduction. You know, that that's what really leaders get out of bed for, and they they see the lean approach to doing. Um, the the element of focus that I'm bringing to you today on this uh, process focus quality culture is really more than just you know, uh, an element of how most companies are implementing lean. It's, it's a, it's a culture change because these point in time events that you would have may see some savings and we do save money. I do these as well, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, my, my team, my organization, we jump in where there might be a, a, an issue. We come up with solutions. We put that in, uh, we either save money or improve quality. And then we we move on, and then we may have to come back to that same point. Um, the process we want to look at here is how do we build that in our DNA, the the focus on that process itself to drive forth quality without having to do you know these point in time lean events. So when we talk about pure lean, the process focus element of it is indicative to it. Uh, matter of fact, if you went to Toyota and asked them about this you know they they may not even know what you're talking about however the elements of how they apply their 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 daily work is very much process focused okay moving on all right so fundamentally we got to understand that all outputs products or services are accomplished from a process so if we're not focusing on our process then we're succeeding by chance and some people do yeah uh, but that doesn't mean they're succeeding at their maximum potential. Uh, a lot of these organizations and these industries, you know, there's a lot of successful people and they're, you know, they don't have all, uh, all the elements of lean. 
um, and they make a lot of money. Now, if money is the measure of success, for some it may be, but uh, ultimately we, uh, we've got a product or service that we're trying to, um, you know, fulfill for the, for the market and, you know, the customer is the ultimate decision maker, you know, did the products or services meet their expectations? Um, and if we're not paying attention to our processes, then we're taking risk on customer satisfaction. And so, um, you know, having this process focused quality culture enables the insurance and increased probability of success of all these products and services. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. And I just highlighted some of these here and you may be in something different, but it's still relevant to the industry that you're in. Um, and I'm a very much Ed Deming study. So when I, when I grew up through the quality, you know, Ed was at his end of life, but all of my mentors were very much, um, into the Deming uh, management philosophies and some of the things that Deming come up with back, you know, uh, in the 50s and the Industrial Revolution time frame, you know, they're still relevant. They, they weren't, they're never outdated and we just don't spend enough time focusing on, um, you know, what he was trying to deploy uh, back then and um, even today. And so one of the fundamental aspects that we're always up against is defects defects coming in in either a product or a service and um, and we're constantly working on trying to prevent those uh, and and correct those in our Kappa processes uh, but Deming says right here it's it's you know we, we, we forget to de detail this that the process design accounts for 80 85 percent of the defects itself um, and process design is management's responsibilities um, most of the time we don't we don't even work on the 85%, we work on the 15%. And that's that's where we tr we're trying to get to zero defects by working on the 15% of the, the calls and not the 85% of the calls. Um, because, you know, it's 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 just what we do in, in organizations. And we gotta get focused on that. We gotta, you know, we gotta get ourselves focused on where, where is our process or how is our process designed? What's our focus on that process? How do we enable it to succeed? Uh, and I think he, Deming was ahead of his time when he came up with some of these philosophies. Um, and I put down in here, and this is just my reiteration on it in the blue box. It says a process without a named leader is a process that is all but lost because processes will evolve. And if there's anything you can take from this, write, write that down and underline uh, the word um, uh, it will evolve because evolution is basically a strategy of hope and we know hope is not a very good strategy because you you, you have no control of it uh, so we want a purpose driven process design meaning that the design of that process is, by nature will enable successful quality uh, so we we want to make sure that occurs and so we we just don't want this strategy of hope we, we want to make sure that these processes have somebody that that is responsible for them and make sure that they succeed so we're going to go into that in more detail all right i'm just checking my timing here all right so what is a process focused quality culture uh, i don't have a 10 page definition for you and we really could break this down in in, in a very long uh, seminar uh, for multiple days but we're going to just summarize it here for you today um, and it's basically ensuring everyone in the organization is focused on process success um, that, that's the tip of the iceberg right so there's a lot underneath that um, both in, you know in, in all these elements quality performance and reliability um, and typically what happens in organizations is processes are designed through sometimes there is an organized pr a process design effort um, and then, you know, leadership abandoned it once it's a process that's created and they expect it to manage itself. Okay. Um, that puts a lot of responsibilities on the, the individual contributor, the, the direct employee that's fulfilling the, the process that they have to have to operate it. They have to evaluate it and improve it with, without leadership support. Um, and, you know, it just depends on the, the magnitude of, um, you know, effort that that individual is wanting to put in is the, the var variation of success that comes out of the process. And so if we don't have all elements, you know, not only the direct employee, but we have their line managers and line manager on top of that and organizational structure around that process to ensure its success, 
the, the probability of success of that process is reduced. And so what we want here is we want, um, you know, basically everyone in the organization um, to focus on that. Uh, and we're going to go more into that in a minute. In, a t in the Toyota production system, um, you know, by far is the best that we've identified. And that's, that's um, purely process focused. So everything they do is focused on improving that process uh, from, from the way it's designed. And there's a whole, if you've done any work in this space, uh, you, you'll recognize the understanding that they want to have on each element of that process to the infinite degree. Uh, and then once it's up and running and they've d decided on what process steps will be, the magnitude of passion that goes forth from everybody in that organization to ensure that process succeeds. Um, it's hard to even articulate that and write that things in books. I mean, you, you've got books from the Toyota way and Jeffrey Lockhart, he's, he done uh, the best job he could to really explain that. But until you see it and you see the passion and the execution, um, you know, rigor that goes around making um, that process succeed, you really don't understand it. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of other people who write books, but until you experience it, it's just another level. Um, and, but that's what we want to get to in our processes and our focus is we want to make sure that that process succeeds all the time. And if we're, if we're doing anything else, whatever that is, it's waste. Now, a lot of organizations will say, what do you mean? You know, I'm a leader. You know, a lot of these leaders will stand up and say, you know, I'm very successful. I'm more successful than you. And, you know, I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. It's my, my shop. I do what, what I want. Okay. That's fine. But ultimately, if you're doing anything other than paying attention to the process, you're, you're doing waste, whatever it may be. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the leadership in the organization, top to bottom, uh, and all the direct employees are working on ensuring that process success. Um, and we, you know, this is another principle that I want to leave you guys with is there's no such thing as perfection on a process out there, but we, uh, we want every process to perform uh, with excellence. I mean, even in Six Sigma, we say that we want, um, you know, all of our processes to perform at 3.4 parts per million, right? So that's that's the level of Six Sigma, which is not perfect, but it's it's getting really close. It's a very small number, very hard to hit, but we, we want it to be perfect. And, and that may, you know, zero defects may never be achievable. It's It's our constant desire that we've got to really quantify and really focus on within organizations to drive quality defects down to zero. And, and, and we want everything to perform perfectly. And we've got to embed that into the DNA of our culture to ensure that passion, that focus is on our processes as, as, as needed for it to pr produce, okay? So, all this being said, I, I do find myself speaking to some leaders in, in, in different organizations um, where, where they're lost. You know, what, what do we do? And so on a napkin one day, I, it, literally, I created this model. Uh, and it, it, it may not be the best model in the world, but it, it does get folks to think different. And so we'll spend a little bit of time here is, is, um, is how does this work? Okay. So basically I'm going to break it down in, in each individual bucket. Um, so the, it's a five step process. Um, the first one is we've got to develop the process. Okay. So you've got to put time into thinking about what your process is going to deliver, uh, and take input into what are all your stakeholder requirements. Um, who's going to own it, assign somebody to own it. Um, you know, has it ever been done before? If there is benchmark it, learn from it. We call this leapfrog technology where, where, or in learning where you're able to learn from other people's mistakes. I mean, um, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel when it, one's already been done and you can learn from it. And that's, I can't un underestimate um, the importance of, of taking that learning. Um, determine and implement all quality design requirements and regulatory requirements up front. The more you do this up front, the more time you put in here, the the better you'll have performance on the back end. Uh, then you've got to create all the infrastructure around from from your equipment to your standard work to your process steps. This is where Toyota excels because nothing goes into a uh, one of their organizations without specific um, thought being put into the infrastructure required for that uh, process, the standard work 
uh, SOPs, if you would, or visual aids that goes in to make it work properly. And so all of that goes into that um, process development. Um, and then from that, once the process is developed, the process has got to inform what type of employee you need. Um, you know, so, so if you want particular outputs from that process, it depends on the, the, the amount of training, the amount of education, the amount of the, the capabilities of the individuals. So you've got to hire the right people. So you've got to make sure that you've got a connection with what the process needs versus the type of individuals you're bringing in. Some processes are very um, flexible and, and you can bring a, a broad perspective of talent in and it still be successful. And that's what we, we want to achieve, the, the, the broadest um, variation of people possible because that increases your hiring uh, potential. However, some processes, for example, if you're doing brain surgery or if you're doing um, uh, molecule development in, in labs or something like this, you know, you need specific training for people and um, ultimately uh, the, whatever the process is, you need to, to make sure that informs the type of individuals you bring in. And then moving onward, um, you've got to train that talent. And Deming says you've got to train and retrain all the time. And fundamentally, it, 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 this is a loss. You know, I, I don't know why this is such a um, um, an issue. I, I guess fundamentally, if you're training someone, then they're not... Um, producing the direct output or their billable hours go down and therefore um, you know there's a control factor put on that and I don't mean to train and retrain on things that are uh, unnecessary but people need trained and they need to know success so we did a, an experiment not too long ago where we brought an independent company in from a from an industry um, and we we measured an as found condition once um, uh, to get a baseline uh, and we controlled one dimension that was training and we provide them excellent training and then we retested them and we saw a significant improvement in, in their ability to perform quality. So the, you can't fix all defects in your organization with training, but one thing we know, you can't have uh, a very uh, good quality measurement without performing good training. So uh, you want to make sure that you, you you've got uh, an engineered training program to where the training is meeting the needs of what the individuals who are performing the work um, uh, that need. Uh, and, and it's not a one in time training. It's got to be trained and then a designated retraining mo uh, module for them. And, and not all training can be done through an online app. Uh, we've, we've digitized everything to try to make it as efficient as possible, but we've got to quantify the 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 need and the and the ability to do on the job training guys and it uh, because without having people training people in a way that they understand and doing the work uh, we're losing a big learning there so uh, big emphasis on training the right people and then the process oversight moving down uh, this process oversight is how do we know the process is working toward the standards that we put in place um, Many people, many organizations require the individual contributor, the direct employee, to do their own oversight uh, or the, the line manager to do that oversight and then they stop at that point. Uh, that's, that's, that's not, not enough. Uh, we need to make sure that that process is performing at the level that it needs to perform at all, all consequence. So everybody needs to be subordinated and make sure that process is a success and it's following the standard work has been de designed. If it's not, that's where we jump immediately into our improvements. So that's the initiation of, of Kaizen, that's the initiation of our uh, any of our continuous improvement is making sure that process is following the standard work uh, as it's been designed. And if not, it's got to be improved. If the design is bad, you jump right in and redesign that process to make it work. There's This is a passion of mine and this is where we got to provide this, uh, this process oversight to make sure people are putting eyes on that process so that it is successful. And if any of you have been in the Toyota production system, you will watch that they walk, walk the floor uh, and physically are seeing what's going on at each um, particular schedule every single day and anything that goes wrong, it's the process is stopped and, and worked on. Um, this is fundamental for this process uh, focus quality culture to work. Uh, and it's, uh, it's essential for, um, you know, to maximize that process's ability to produce products and services at its, um, at, at, at its maximum capability.
Uh, and finally, you got to improve all steps. And this is a this is an element to where you know some companies will jump in and, and improve certain elements of it, but we got to be focused on that process, and we got to make sure we're constantly have a passion to drive out waste, to identify our problems. Um, you know, organizations need to pride themselves that they find their problems before their issues, uh, you know, whether it's an, um, an, an audit or inspections or it's product that gets out, it gets, um, you know, found and you have recalls, any, any industry you're in, um, you want to find things before they break and you need to reward that in the organization. So our continuous improvement aspects has got to just be escalated to make sure we're looking at each element of the process to make sure it's working as it needs to work. So we drive out all the waste uh, and have that passion for, for, for perfection. So the five-step process is you got to develop the process steps, hire the right people, train and, um, and test it all the time. You got to have uh, process oversight and continuous improve all steps. So those are uh, fundamental and I, I believe it works and um, and I've used this model uh, multiple times and um, you know have, have had much success out of it and it's uh, it, I find it easier for leadership to understand these dimensions than just you know throwing a bunch of tools and techniques at them from from a lean approach all right moving on um, so <clears throat> step two of this process is is I'm gonna concentrate on the subordination of all activities um, and, you know, why do I want to focus on this? And it, it's really a, a, a leadership challenge. And if we look at the aspect, and I drew up this Pareto analysis here, and, and, and these are just recommendations. These are not hard facts. And for each industry, it may be different. But basically, we want our leaders, um, we used to call them managers or, and those kind of things, whatever the nomenclature is in your organization. Um, to be focused on that process, that means they've got to spend time with it. So we've got the concept of Gimba, so to go see where the value is being transferred. Uh, and I've I've transitioned Gimba um, in my conversations from just the word Gimba to Gimba with a purpose. And some of you say, well, Gimba has a purpose, right? But most leaders, if you tell them to go Gimba, it's a social interaction. Um, we, we can't just go out and say hi to people, which I think is a value. I want to say hi to people, how you doing, ask about their families and that kind of stuff. But I, I also, we've got a role to play as leaders and that's to verify standard work. And that's why, that's where with a purpose comes into play is if you're going out to, looking at the shop floor or, you know, a lot of our processes are not shop floor related. Mine, mine are not uh, in my current day job. And we're all over the world and we do work on computers and virtually all the time. So uh, your Gimba may be a virtual uh, participation with your team as they're doing work. Um, and you give them feedback um, on are they, is the work that they're doing meeting the standard work that you expect from them. Uh, and this is not a, I'm, I'm gonna put my thumb over you and make you do what I want you to do. This is a, a learning, coaching and mentoring opportunity. Uh, for leaders to ensure that the individuals are following standard work. And if they're not, why not? Maybe there's a training that needs to be done, or maybe there's a tools or techniques that need to be done, uh, or maybe there's a reward and, and recognition that needs to happen for, you know, uh, people that are doing things right versus wrong or, or wrong versus right, depends on what you're looking for. But that, that gimbal with a purpose to, to, to go see, physically or virtually, to verify all standard work, to look for waste, problems, deviations from standard work, help the team solve for work, to, ex to set up the expectations from a leadership perspective that um, deviation of process is, is, is not what we're looking for. We're looking for the application of standard work to ensure your brand integrity, to ensure your product integrity or your service integrity, whatever you may be uh, producing. You wanna help the team to solve, uh, to identify and eliminate the waste uh, or eliminate all barrier, barriers for process success, success. I use the analogy and I put it down here at the bottom is that the, the TV show, The Undercover Boss. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but I, I find it quite interesting to see these executives that, that dress up like their, uh, their employees and perform the work as a direct employee and all the learning and insights they get. And it's, it's revolutionary and, and they made a TV show out of it. Well, they should have been doing that anyway. 
you know, they should be uh, eliminating all unnecessary activities that the leadership are doing to be focused on that process, to be doing that every single day. Um, and you know, it, it, it is a, it's a great learning and we, we, we as lean practitioners, um, you know, we have to encourage our leaders uh, to focus on that process to ensure that enablement of quality uh, and all the dimensions of that process success. So I thought I'd throw that in as a, uh, as a caveat. All right, another uh, academic quote, and really got to understand the aspect behind this is we've been ruined by the best efforts of people who are doing the wrong thing. So if you're doing anything other than paying attention to the process, why? What, what are you doing? You know, why are we in existence as a company or an organization? And, and that's to provide a product or a service, whatever that product or service may be. And so if you're doing anything other than paying attention to the process, then you're doing the wrong things. Uh, so we got to convince the organization to do the right things. And that's, you know, that's our challenge um, as quality and lean professionals to make sure that we are giving the leaders the information they need to be successful. And that means they, they need to be um, held accountable for focusing on this process. You know, uh, some stories that we, we can tell is I was in a, a situation with a leader, a very um, high level leader. And the, the uh, just happened to be a lady at this point. And, you know, I'm, I'm asked the question um, because some data come back that the, the, the employees um, didn't understand what she expected uh, or they didn't understand the requirements of the job. And so I said, well, just show me your, uh, your daily work. Well, what is your daily work? What is your calendar? And she was um, very nicely all shared that information with me. And we went through there and we looked at it. And there wasn't a percentage of time that she was spending time with the employees to see what they were doing. And this is not manufacturing based. This is process based at, uh, you know, transactional type, type of work. And so we had to build into her daily work structure time with people so she could go look and see what they're doing, not to, you know, <laughs> um, to be negative about it, but from a positive proactive aspect of it, she learned, they learned, and the interaction was much better, the quality improved, all that kind of stuff. So this is what Ed Deming is, is trying to achieve here, is we want to get the people who make impact to the organization to do the right things. Um, all right, so if we do nothing, if we don't have this process focused quality culture, what happens? And so this is a degradation curve that we see on process performance. So all processes will degrade in quality and performance over time, if not designed to maintain properly. Um, it, it, it does not maintain itself. We continue to add on steps. We, we add on waste process. You know, if you're producing a, uh, with a manufacturing piece of equipment, you know, you've got spindle wear, you've got wear and all the, the gears and, and all the tooling that goes in part of it. So if you don't pay attention to it, it it'll con continue to degrade. The same with transactional processes. We continue to add additional steps uh, through our transactions. Um, and it continues to grow and grow and grow, and eventually we do a Kaizen, uh, jump in there and, and reduce some things, and then it grows and grows and gets worse, and, and so it's a, it's a constant uh, doom loop of waste that is applied. Um, just imagine yourself walking through mud with, with your boots on. You continue to walk as you walk. The mud keeps um, um, uh, adding on to your shoes. Same thing happens to a process. So if we don't pay attention to it, it it's, going, it's going to get worse. And so, you know, I use the analogy. Here's another analogy. Your, your car, if you don't do the maintenance on your car, adding tires, changing oil, you know, uh, evaluating um, uh, all the leaks and the, um, the squeaks that you, you see from time to time, then it's going to break down on you uh, and you're going to have lower performance. So um, we've got to make sure we do it at a minimal to maintain the process, keeping it steady state, but we want to make sure it's improved. So we want to constantly desire to, to drive up uh, the quality of performance. So if you do nothing, this is what you get. Uh, and a lot of organizations do get this. Um, but if you pay attention to your process, you can stop the, um, the degradation curve and you can flatten it at, at, at worst and improve it at best. And that's what we want you to accomplish. 
so we talk about culture and and you know there's a lot of people that can break down culture in many different ways and you know write books and have months of uh, dissertations on it and classes and you know and all those kind of things but we in the industry we've got to do something about it um and you know we talk about organizational culture it's it's basically i break it down in the in the this individual statement it's it's how we behave okay it's it's the it's how we behave and then what influences our behavior well it's how we develop processes around that behavior you know so i'll give you an example um i have teenage daughters or my daughters are just a little older than teenagers now but not too long ago they were learning to drive and so if if i you know just hand them the keys and say good luck you know that culture is going to yield something bad you know they're going to go out and have tickets and get have wrecks and all that kind of stuff it's just not going to work uh, because you know it's the process I put around did not inform the behavior I'm looking for but through a different model which would mean you know we, we train them we, we take them we, we we show them what to, to do first uh, we put them behind the wheel and we guide them along the way coach them and teach them and mentor them along the way eventually you got su success now they may still make a mistake here or there but ultimately the process or the culture we built around them was one to inform them of the expectations to not to violate the speed limit to drive safely and all that kind of stuff but that's what we want to do with our organizational structure we we want to make sure we've got the elements around it to inform the processes that we're wanting to produce to produce it in the right way and what we fail to do with our culture is to build that infrastructure to, of support that the process is um, a value proposition within an organization of which we strategically want to maintain uh, and therefore our culture meaning our, our processes around it making sure we subordinate all of our leadership to go ensure process success to ensure you know the right measurements oversight and, and improvement that goes on in the process just don't occur so, so we can implement culture enabling steps simply by putting structure around the way we want processes to perform. Um, so it, it's not this, um, you know, uh, far reaching uh, statement culture that, you know, it's just so far above my head and my pay grade, I can't work on it. You can work on it. And, and it's, it's what you say, it's the processes you execute and the focus you make as a leader in organization uh, to drive forth the, uh, the quality from these processes. So I, we, we very much can influence the culture in our organization. So you just got to understand we want to ensure that people behave within the organization to support the processes. Um, all right, so how do we get this? This process focus quality what I call strategy infusion. <laughs> it's, um, you know, we, we look at our people, our strategy, our culture, all these elements, and, uh, you know, what do we include in an organizational strategy to ensure our process quality uh, focused culture? Check my time here, make sure I'm good. Okay. So the difficult um, task at hand is to really, you know, fundamentally change leadership's mindsets and behaviors. and um, and how do we do that uh, from you know from what they do day to day and they they value that and there's a lot of things that in, that inform them on what they should do you know what their boss's expectations are uh what what book that they happen to read yet, uh tomorrow the the seminar they went to you know there, there's a lot of competition i would say for leaders to uh to focus on and ultimately in order for them to see process focus culture is valuable we have to influence this uh, to a model to where they they you know follow standard work and uh, look for gimbal with a purpose as part of their daily work so one of my mentors come up with this model or deviation from this model and it, it's it's considered strategy structure behavior results so if you want to change your results doing a work back plan here how do you change results of an organization, whether it's profit and loss, EBITDA, quality, whatever it is, you got to you got to come back one, and that's in behaviors. So the behaviors produce the results. So how do you influence behavior? Well, that's through structure. We talked about that a little earlier. You got to you got to have the right SOPs. You got to have the right visual aids. You got to have right process designs. You've got to have your right uh, process oversight that kind of stuff and then from how do you get the right structure is that goes back through strategy 
So I'm going to focus on what leaders usually focus on the most, right? You know, they, they will pay attention to results, but ultimately the things that they play with to get better results is the strategy and the structure. So these are the areas that we, we want to focus on. So an organizational um, uh, strategic or strategy process is, you know, our, our leaders within the organization spend a lot of time thinking about strategy. You know, where is our, our company going to go? Uh, and by when. Um, this is where we've got to infuse the element of this process focus quality culture in, into this decision making process because this is what this is what gets them excited and gets them out of bed every day and that's where they want to spend their time is to focus on the strategic direction of the organization. But if, if the strategy doesn't inform the structure correctly then the focus on the quality process uh, or the process quality will not occur. And so we, we as uh, you know, leaders in quality and, and lean, we've got to spend some time with these leaders and explain to them the value propositions of doing things correctly. Um, and it's tough, uh, and there's no doubt about it because you know these organizations, a lot of them are successful. They're meeting their their growth targets. They're growing the company. They're seen as highly successful leaders, but yet they're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> so that's a very a painful discussion to say, yeah, but you're, you, you're doing this, but you're leaving opportunity on the table and you're creating this hidden factory of defects within your organization that your, your teams are having to solve and all that time and effort should be put up front to where you, you design these processes correctly to ensure success. Um, so, you know, just like I said here, our organization with strong process fo uh, focused cultures establish a strategy that their organizations will focus on processes and the quality of that thereafter and establish goals and objectives to accomplish it, this by a given time. If you look at your company stra strategy and you don't have these elements of it, it's a mess. That means um, uh, the, the leaders are not going to support the structure around that strategy to enable that process performance. So just like I said, there's a lot of competition. Leaders can choose whatever they want to, and I just put some of those. I mean, you can look up every leadership book uh, and online course, and every one of them's got their five step, seven step, 10 step, 14 step, whatever it is, process to enable uh, good leadership. But ultimately, uh, quality has got to be in there. We've got to fight for that, uh, that time so we can get that focus of leaders to ensure that they understand the importance of freeing up time for, from uh, you know all the leaders up and down the ladder. If you remember that Pareto that I put in front of you earlier, where you know each level of the organization needs to spend a certain amount of time on their reviewing their process. Um, you know depends on where they are, and and that will en enable that leader to learn and to eliminate any barrier for that pr process success. Uh, help the team's problem solve and identify ways to make that process better so it's constantly improving and not degrading um, as a lot of processes are. So we've got to infuse with our leaders this process focused quality culture. We've got to get them to value what that is and to assign time for their organization and even th they need to no matter where they are in the organization, spend time looking at these processes to make sure at least the level underneath them is executing the way they, they need to, to enable that process performance. So some of the strategic things that you may see um, in, in people's strategy is, is basically, you know, they'll come up with some type of statement. And, and I don't mean this is a slogan because, um, you know, Deming will tell you to eliminate slogans. But this is really uh, a focus to get leaders to assign um, responsibility within the organization to achieve. And that's to enable every leader in the organization to understand what the process focus quality leader does and to implement the process focus activities, i.e. Toyota production system type of activities, to enable this to be in the culture forever. Um, you know, that's, that's a kind of a utopia. Um, and like I said, if you went to Toyota and said, explain to me your process focus quality culture, that they, they would look at you strangely because they wouldn't know what that means. They'll say, well, let me show you what we do. And then from the evidences of what they do, you can say, oh, now I know what you're talking about. The focus on the quality is what everyone in the organization is subordinated to do. And that's what we're trying to enable in all of our, 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 our groups. Um, 
I do find a lot of good um, teachings and, and insight from from Jeffrey Liker, and I do, um, you know, have all his books and, and uh, all, uh, use them on a daily basis to, to help inform what I need to do as a blueprint to uh, to focus organization on uh, improving quality and 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 you know uh, just a lean approach to make sure we're maximizing what we're able to do. And so I just thought I'd put that out there. If you've not read that um, materials, it's a, it's a good opportunity to go uh, to pick it, pick that up and, and to learn. All right, uh, we're just about done here. So um, th this is just a statement, guys, that uh, the quality products or service, uh, it just doesn't happen by chance. Now you can try that model. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a change approach we call self-assembly or the spray and pray method where you just throw a bunch of things out there and just hope something sticks and works. It just very ra rarely does it, does it work, right? Um, and I put in here that we never accidentally create good quality. Uh, you know, you, you just don't show up one day and become a, uh, a superstar race car driver or a brain surgeon. You know, you have to have a, a proactive, very thought through process to, to yield a quality output. Uh, and we have to do that within a, in all the practices that we do in industry uh, to ensure good success. Um, so proactively having a process focused quality culture will ensure uh, quality is the output, uh, whatever you're making, uh, whether it's a product or a service, this, this insight will ensure um, the, the increased probability of success. Uh, like I said, there's nothing perfect, but it's our constant desire to be perfect that will drive forth our, um, uh, our process focus and uh, the activities that we find in our processes to, to drive forth improvement. So with that, I, I, I'll, um, uh, I'll stop the presentation and then check and see, um, Ellen, if we've got any questions um that's came through the uh the chat yes thank you sorry i had to run and get a plug in my, my laptop um let's start at the top here make sure that i've got the right and thank you for that presentation um i i have to say that i totally resonate re i totally <laughs> everything that you've said i would agree with and and um, see the value in. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Well, I appreciate it. Yep. I've been doing this for many, many years. And I think as you pointed out, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, um, it, it really just does um, actually, you know, work in every industry and is important for every industry, no matter what we're doing. No matter what, that's right. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure there's a question here about value stream mapping, and I'm not sure. Uh, it says here, first slide does not include value stream mapping. If this is essential to map opportunities to eliminate, I guess if they're asking if that's essential to eliminate waste in the value stream, I'm not sure. If the, they're asking something about the value stream mapping activity, and I guess it's, you know, it's... Um, well, value stream mapping is a is a tool we use in Lean to to basically quantify certain measurements within the process and help to increase the value added percentages that each of our processes produce. Okay, so it is a tool we use within you know this structure. So how would value stream mapping be used in this? So in the model, the five step model that I said, the last step is continuous improvement, and I think value stream ma mapping would would fit into that. To where you would constantly have a uh, a view of performance of how that process works, looking for waste and eliminating waste. So, um, you know, I love value stream mapping. Do it all the time. Have done it a lot in my my career to identify the high potential waste producing processes, and really benchmark process steps to each other to make sure that we've um, we've 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 got the waste uh, been worked on. So that's the way I'd answer that one. Thank you. Um, I, it, this question is, David, I'm happy to see that you've included talent management in a quality cult culture. How do you leverage HR in creating a, a quality culture? Um, hold on a second. 
And I think they're saying some more, but that's probably enough of the question for you to understand. Yeah, I love our HR partners, right? And usually I find a, a good conversation with them on, um, uh, you know, on talent and development around quality because ultimately, and leadership, right? All these elements of leadership um, development because a lot of these organizations are, um, sorry if you hear dogs in my background, but uh, <laughs> we all working from home now, so we have to live with this. But the uh, the, the aspect of uh, what we do in HR is uh, in, influence them to 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 enable development of, of programs that support what quality initiative is. So if if individuals are are not being developed, that's it's a loss, it's a miss. And so we have to encourage our HR partners to to enable quality through uh, number one, the talent that they they recruit, uh, and number two, uh, the the developmental processes, how they train, how they you know identify the the classes and stuff that people should take, um, identify the talent to take those classes and, and check compliance. So you know they they have a role to play, and we just need to partner with them to make sure that occurs. How rigorous and at what frequency should process oversight happen? Daily. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, that's the that's a utopia, and, and it depends on how many activities you're doing, right? So you may not be able to do daily. So I I say that in just, but uh, you know, it just depends on how often things are done. Um, what I what I encourage organizations to do is break down your processes in what I call key core processes. Uh, what are the key things your people are delivering that uh, enables uh, process output or, or um, quality to, to occur? Identify how frequent those are and look at them on a, a statistical um, process. So what, what can that be? Well, it, it just depends on your risk. You know, if, you're, if you've got a high risk uh, output and you're producing something that if it breaks, it kills people, you want to you verify it more frequent. Right. So, uh, um, you know, daily might not be enough. It might be multiple times per day. If you've got something that's executed very infrequently as a process that your people are doing and um, and the risk of it is not um, going to kill someone or cause people harm, then you can adjust from there. But, um, you know, it depends on it is if you're running a sales organization, you know, twice a year might be good enough. And some of the examples I've got, that's what we, we've worked on is, you know, having teams go do ride-alongs with their their talent that's in the field and make sure they're they're doing this following standard work a couple times a year that may be fine uh but you just have to look at what the you're looking at the risk that around it and how frequent it's done and and come up with your own model of how often there's, there's not a one size fits all for that question it was interesting i think you addressed this at one point but um, i think about when we often put new processes in place or probably even greater, we put a new uh, a new technology, quote unquote, fix, right, to make the process mm -hmm. better, faster. And then um, the real miss is not going back and really understanding what that impact is on the staff as well as the process itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing more of that as we advance in technology uh, mm -hmm. where we think, yeah, you know, we've got this great answer. We're going to automate this. We're going to add this. And it's, oh, it's just going to make it so much faster. And then the big miss is not going back and saying, okay, what did this really do for the employee and how did it really work and you know what what really following up on that. So Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, you know, it's very interesting to, to see how we invest money and why we invest money in new technology from from organization to organization. Some people invest in new technology because that's their only chance to increase their price. Okay. Mm -hmm. if, if you guys in certain manufacturing industries, you know, some of these requirements, especially in the big three, is you got to reduce your price year over year. And there's no exception in order to be in the business. You've got you got to have price reductions. Right. And so and, and typically the only time that price can be reset is if you bring something innovative to the, the design of your product or service or technology. And that's where they want to invest their money because they can drive a higher price. Well, that means they want to be leading edge. And so a lot of these leading edge technologies, and, and, I, and I love leading edge. I love new technology. I mean, we all get the new smartphones, so we drive the newest cars, you know, all that kind of stuff. We, we all are infused in that space, and I love it too. But from a Toyota principle, here's the missing link in that, 
is that leading edge technology may not have enough data to, to prove quality, performance, reliability factors. And mm -hmm. so what we don't do a good enough job in industries is learning about that le leading edge technology before we implement it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would in, encourage organizations to do more in that space. Uh, it, it is a tough sell. Um, I'm just being honest with you because leaders want, you know, they want to get that as fast as possible and that, that gets them out of bed. That, that gets them motivated. You want to see somebody smile. You know, they're, they're investing in leading edge. It's the future, blah, 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 blah. And it's great. We all do. We want that. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we, there's a trailing well, liability. <laughs> Say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. It's fun and, and it's exciting, but yeah. But to your point, yeah. It, th there's a risk, you know, that leading edge technology is unproven, and that's something that you'll see. These these companies that are pure lean, they put more time in that focus. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they they may not be on the the tip of the leading curve. They may be just behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is why is because it's proven. Mm -hmm. um, and that may be the best model for people to, to go for, and it may not. Um, and if, if it's not, then on that curve or that five-step process that we talked about, uh, you got to spend more time in the sections around oversight and continuous improvement. If you're implementing um, state-of-the-art processes, that's, you know, leaders are, are not going to let you do more design. They're going to force that down on us then that's the areas of focus we got to play and we got to emphasize that with our leaders to make sure you know we're doing what we can to to find and and improve uh, at a rapid pace thank you uh, next question how do you manage the gemba process with the new type of remote work yeah it's interesting right so we've all had to learn this and it's you know um it works um but you, you you know, if you've got a remote team and I've got, my team is remote. I mean, we're all over the world. And, and ultimately to do a Gimba and you just, you know, if, if they're, whatever their work is, you want to, you want to evaluate it. And so if you're not able to see it, then ask them in your one-to-one -one times inquiry questions that, um, you know, proactively you've thought through that would give them some, magnitude of thought on how they would execute in those scenarios um, you know simulations are good uh, to, to to create and, and the goal is here is not to, to, to find performance um, you know management criteria the goal was to improve quality okay so you know, proactively, you've got to, if you're doing this remote and they've not seen this before, you've got to talk to your team and let them know what you're trying to do. That, you know, you're not trying to, to bring a hammer down on them to, to reduce their pay and benefits or their promotional, um, you know, opportunities in, in, in the organization. You're there to ensure they're following standard work to yield a good quality output. And, and the only way you know, need to know how to do this is if, you know, your interactions with them yield with, with some of that output and uh, proactively do it, you know, reward them for it. Um, you know, whatever your reward and recognition systems are for your company for allowing you to come in there and, and in, interface with them so they understand, you know, uh, what you're trying to do and what kind of behavior you're trying to perform. Um, let's see. What's well, one one more question? What should employees do? Oh, this is a tough one. What should employees do if the focus of the company is not in line with what we have learned here today? Well, you know, yeah, uh, the the organizational influence um, is, is difficult, especially from a bottom up. Uh, but it doesn't happen if you don't try. So we need we need folks to be pioneers. We need folks folks to to identify opportunities, communicate that to their leadership teams in a constant um, improving way to to influence the leaders. You know, so you would start with your own supervisor. You know, say, hey, listen, here's an opportunity for us to drive forth improvement in quality. These are some concepts that are proven. And, and, and it will help us um, separate ourselves from our competition. And, 
and just get the insight of your leader and see if they're interested in it. Some may tell you to go fish, right? Well, um, and, and you just try different different approaches, you know, from whatever level you've got to try to influence that. And and not every organization will, you know. Some of these organizations, and, and I, I had to learn this too, the relationship between profit margins and their desire to be lean seem to be uh, oppositely um, opposed to each other. The bigger the profit margins, the less they want to pay attention to it. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know what organization you're in, but um, you know, if it's if it's got a lower profit margins, then the appetite will be greater. Um, that doesn't mean people that uh, have a large margin, um, you know, wouldn't like to have larger margins. But um, you know, fundamentally, you got to speak the language. You know, if you want to grow your margins, here's an opportunity for you to grow your margins by reducing the quality uh, defects that perform on that process. It starts with conversations and uh, and influence and um, and see where it goes. And if it doesn't work, maybe you just quit, <laughs> go somewhere else. I'm just joking, but that's that's always an opportunity. I use my term uh, to add to that, you know, the networking piece of it, but it's even just planting the seed. I mean, I think you have to have a lot of patience, right? So it's it's one kind of small piece at a time or one seed at a time that you hope eventually grows into some interest in in this in this method, in this way, in this culture. Oh. It, it, well, every organization started somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the the Toyota production system did not start overnight as the Toyota production system and evolved over decades, mm -hmm. right? It was a decade evolution of a process. So who started that? And we can equip that down to one person, Mr. Ed Deming. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at it, you know, who, who he, he was not even of their culture and, and they, you mm -hmm. know, the Japanese came to America and, and asked him to help. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was just, a, you know, an engineer out of GE, right? And um, so fundamentally, change can occur through one conversation at a time. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's a good way to end this. Um, reminder, this will be recorded. Uh, there'll be a YouTube video once it's kind of, we clean it up and put it on, or Manny does, um, the YouTube, the LED ASQ YouTube site. And you should get an email with uh, credits. And don't forget about our next webinar in August. We have one each month. And I think there were a couple questions we did not address, but what I will do is I will send those or get those to David and hopefully he can uh, address those um, separately. So thank you very much for your time, David. Um, really good presentation, and thanks, everyone, for participating. Have My a great pleasure. Day. Wish everyone well. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye.